Oh, thank you, team. Good morning. Thank you so much for coming out to worship with us this morning. If you're visiting with us, we'd especially like to welcome you. And if you're visiting with us for the very first time this morning, I hope you'll take a few moments after the service to stop by our guest table, which is on your right in the lobby. We have a nice gift for you there. We'd love an opportunity to get to know you better. But in the meantime, would those of you on the right side of the pew start the pew pad across the row, please? Give us your name and address as the pad goes by and remember to send it back open when it reaches the end of the row. Well, the United Methodist women are inviting all women of the church to their luncheon and general meeting today, immediately following this service over in the social hall. That's the building on your right, double doors. Uh, you're welcome to uh, just head on over there and have some lunch, uh, get to know some fine women. And um, that's for women only, guys, just so you know, sorry. Uh, but um, <laughs> squirrel. <laughs> Uh, in any case, the Methodist women are having a luncheon after this service. Please join them over in the social hall. This afternoon, we're gathering to celebrate Susan Pardue and her 47 years of ministry here at the church. That takes place from 2 to 4 over in the Boys and Girls Club on the north end of our campus. You don't have to be there right at 2. I'm hoping to get there just so I get the best cookies, but you guys can show up whenever you want. So that's, uh, we look forward to seeing you there. Uh, this evening is our Bluegrass uh, Greats concert. That starts at 6 here in the sanctuary. Doors open at 5. We encourage you to get here early. No tickets will be sold. We're just taking donations at the door. Come out for that. And finally, all during January, we're collecting mana bag supplies. Uh, if you're not familiar with them, mana bags are kept in your car as an alternative to giving money uh, to someone on a street corner if you're concerned with how the money will be spent. Uh, they're an alternative to doing nothing if you're concerned what Jesus would do when he saw a need. Um, it's not going to solve the greater problems of homelessness or hunger, but it is something that you can do for one person right here and right now. And so we'll have a mana bag building event uh, Sunday, February 1st between services, which means if you want to participate, come a little early to this service. Uh, but all month long, we're going to be collecting the contents of the mana bags, bottled water, canned meat, uh, crackers, socks, and things of that nature. There's a list on your Green is for Go mission insert in your bulletin. So check that out. We do thank you for being such a generous congregation. But now if you would, would you stand so that we might remember why we do what we do to honor God.
standing as we affirm our faith together by saying the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to be here this morning in your house, in your church, and singing your hymns and praises. What a privilege that is. And thank you so much that we can come here and your mercies are new every morning regardless of what has happened this week or yesterday or even this morning on our way here, we can start afresh and anew again here with you. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your forgiveness. And Lord, please forgive us for all the times that we mess up, for all the times we fall short when we're quick to anger, when we say harsh words to others, when we do the things that you know, that we know will dishonor you, and when we fail to act when we know we should. Oh Lord, please forgive us. And God, I lift up everyone in this room this morning People come here with so many different worries and concerns. All our circumstances are different, but you know them. You know each of our hearts so intimately. And I just pray that you touch each person and let them feel your presence. Let them know that you are walking alongside them regardless of what is going on how dark it may feel, how lonely it may feel, the God of the universe is right there, right there waiting, waiting for us to notice. We thank you for that, God. And we continue to pray for wisdom and discernment as to how to be the church you have called us to be. And for each of us in this room, how to be the people that you have called us to be. Help us each find the breathing room that we need to grow closer to you. And as always, we pray for the community around the church and we pray that they will somehow, some way, get a glimpse of Jesus when they step in this building. Help us be so welcoming, radically welcoming to all those who are here. God, help us show your love and your compassion 
in your grace in a way that is real and authentic. We love you and we are so grateful, most of all for your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now we have the privilege and the joy of giving back to God through our tithes and offerings. And remember, um, this should be a joy. All we have is God's. He's given it all to us anyway. We like to think it's ours, but it's not really ours. And so now we have the privilege of giving some of that back to God to use for his kingdom. And remember, if you have served in mission or service, some kind of service for at least an hour this week, please put a risk-taking mission and service card in the plate as well, because that is one more way that we give back to God. Would the ushers now come forward so we may receive our tithes and offerings? Dear God, thank you so much for these gifts, for your gifts, for how you have just blessed us and, and done so much for us. We are so grateful. Help us take what you have generously given and use it for your glory. In your holy and precious name, amen. And now, I know now we, we get 
in these ruts where we, I say, now turn and greet one another, I would like you to turn and greet someone different this morning as we think about being radically hospitable. <laughs> I both love and hate that video. <laughs> because obviously, I mean, the reason why I hate it is because it's so intense and I love it because it really captures uh, the picture of what it is that we do to ourselves without ever intending to do it. I mean, we intuitively know our need to have breathing room in our lives. And yet sometimes it's so hard to find it. I mean, we talked about, you know, the potential of being in the the red zone of our lives, of being over the danger line, um, of running too fast, uh, or as Rick Connor likes to put it, of not having enough slow in your roll. Um, and, and one of the things that I've done is discovered a rhythm in my own weekly life and as I work um, and, and I consider my schedule through the years. And, and I want you to remember a few things before I go through this exercise. This is me. This is just me. Uh, I'm just sharing, you know, what happens for me. Everybody's different. Also, um, my job and my calling fit together beautifully. I have the privilege of having a job that fits together with precisely what it is God's called me to do. What an honor and a privilege that is. Some people, however, <clears throat> they just have jobs. 
I mean, you may love your job, but you acknowledge, well, yeah, but it's a job. My calling is over here doing this with and for people, okay? Another thing that I need to acknowledge is not just that, that everybody's different and has different rhythms and that, that I have a job and calling that fit together beautifully is I don't have any children, okay? <clears throat> that skews what works for me in, in substantial ways. Uh, we can all acknowledge the reality that when, when you have children in your life, that a substantial amount of time needs to, and you want to spend a lot of time um, with them and for them in life. Um, so here's, here's my rhythm. What I've discovered on my breathing room gauge is that if I work 40 hours a week, I feel under-challenged. Okay, that's just, that's just me. I mean, that's without, with the way that the limits and the way that my life works, um, I feel like um, God deserves more from me in my calling and the church deserves more from me as their pastor, okay? Now, what I also find is that if I operate, if I work 65 to 70 hours per week, um, my life becomes a little bit on the unmanageable side. I become the cranky pastor, Okay. Is it ever good to have a cranky pastor? No. no. Is it ever good to have a... Cr- <laughs> that was Denise, my wife, by the way, who was agreeing with my assessment. Um, <clears throat> now, here's the thing. There are going to be some weeks that, that this is what I do, and I understand that. But I cannot plan to function in my danger zone for very long because life becomes unmanageable and, and it doesn't benefit me or you to be in that zone. What I found is, is kind of the sweet spot for my work life is somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 55 hours per week. Makes me feel like I'm, I'm purposeful, I have meaning, um, there's joy, there's enough space for me to to maneuver around the various areas of my life so that that I'm taking care of myself, my relationships, and the church, okay? So that's just, that's my personal rhythm, and that works for me. Um, Now, here's here's another interesting thing. Some of you who are going, oh, that doesn't apply to me, I'm retired. And that's not true. There are retired people who function in in the red zone, danger zone, place as well. And they're, they're on the edge of, of burning out. It still happens. Um, some of you are in that, that red zone right now. Now, so as we think today, you know, just imagine where, where are you at? Is there a way in which you're under challenged? Are you in the danger zone? Are you hitting the sweet spot um, of your life? And acknowledging that we may have to run a sprint once in a while over here, but that cannot be normal. That can't be our our everyday standard. Denise and I laughed about the fact that when we looked at the First United Methodist Church of Brandon calendar for today, it was kind of ironic that that, uh, we were talking about, you know, schedule today in the sermon series um, in terms of breathing room because we got three services today. Um, United Methodist Women's Lunch is this afternoon right after the service. Right after that at 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. is the reception for Susan Pardue. Um, At 5 p.m. there's a spaghetti dinner and student ministry. And then at at 6, we come back here and we've got the bluegrass. (sighs) So now the good news is, is that that all of us don't have to come to all of those things. But some of us do have to kind of go to most of those things. And that's, that's just reality, and that's okay. But, but this is not a poster child day for a breathing room in our life of our church. But see, here's the thing. It is easy for us to forget that time is a gift from God. And as we, we dig into things today, I want you to, um, I want you to pull out your mission Uh, your risk-taking mission and service insert and turn it over on the back are sermon notes. Some of you love to take notes. Some of you never take notes. Uh, Either way is fine with me. Um, But on the bottom, I want you to hold this close because there's going to be something to do later. Um, And as you look at the bottom, what I want you to do, there's a plus, a minus, a greater than, and another minus. Change that last minus to a less than. Okay, then, then you'll be ready, ready to go um, for what happens in the, in the, when we challenge you and, and invite you to reflect um, at the end of the service. 
Um, the, uh, the reality for all of us is that we need breathing room in our lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, I pray that you'll help each one of us, no matter where we are um, on our own breathing room gauge, discern what it is that you want for our one and only lives. Help us never be under-challenged. Um, help us not try and run in the, the red zone, the danger zone for too long, but help us to find the sweet spot where uh, the work that you are doing in us is growing and being encouraged by our commitments and our connections with other people and with you. Thank you, God. I pray now that you'll help each person hear the message that you need them to hear, regardless of the words that come out of my mouth, and help me get out of the way so you can come and truly be the way, the truth, and the life in the lives of the hearers who are gathered here today. In Jesus' wonderful and precious name we pray. Amen. Now, let's, let's clarify something from last week when we opened up the sermon series on breathing room. This is not about cleaning up your house, your garage, or your closet. Um, some of you have told me that you went and did that. Um, uh, all of us have different levels of clutter tolerance in our lives. And you know what? If you like a mess, that's okay. The point here, though, is we just don't want our schedules our finances, and our relationships to look like some of our closets. We want there to be some real genuine breathing room, some space. Um, breathing room is the space between our current pace and our limits. We talked last week about each one of us has limits, and we have to recognize that we are running a long-distance race with the finish line in mind. And that means picking a sustainable pace for our life over the long haul, and that's different. When there is no breathing room, that means there's no space between our pace and our limits, and when there's no breathing room, we have lots more stress, lots more anxiety, and our relationships suffer. Last week, we talked about um, God commanding us to a Sabbath, that is withdrawing for a 24-hour period and not working. But it wasn't just in 2015 we want to acknowledge that it's not just about not working. It's about making sure that we withdraw from our regular activities to connect more deeply with God and with one another, which can become a daily sort of thing that we want to do. It's not just about taking time off. Um, it's about connecting more deeply with God. So today as we, we consider our schedule and, and what we do with our time, we're going to be taking a look eventually at, uh, at Psalm uh, chapter 90. And, um, but oftentimes what we do is we add more into our schedule without ever taking anything out. So what we do is we cram, 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 and then we have more, 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 and, and we haven't eliminated anything out of our schedule in the midst of that. As you consider your own schedule, have you ever wondered to yourself, why in the world did I say yes to that thing? Um, and, and one of the things I want you to understand is that no is not a bad word. No. Nothing happened to me when I just said no. Okay? Um, when Denise and I are invited, we love for you to invite us to do things, but please don't ever be offended if we say no, because it could be that we're just looking for some more breathing room in our schedule. It could be that we already had something else to do um, that was a part of the schedule. Um, so, so no matter what, we, we love for you to ask, but, but don't be offended if we say no for whatever reason. Sometimes we won't even give you a reason. I mean, you know what? you owe no one an explanation about why you say no. Now, you may choose to give someone an explanation in service of the relationship to be certain that, that um, they know that you value um, their friendship and, and, um, and you're considering them in the midst of that. That's a good thing as well. But don't ever think it, that no is a bad word. Why? Because breathing room is a good thing and we need it. So it's interesting, this Psalm 90, it's the only one that, that's written by Moses, and he was about 100, lived to be about 120 years old, so he probably packed a lot of wisdom into that, and, and this is his, his talking about time and our schedule. And Andy Stanley talks about Moses having four real separate periods in his life. The first one 
is, uh, is when he, um, he was, was passed down the river um, by his mother and, and a, a daughter of the Pharaoh found him and, and he grew up as an Egyptian in the Pharaoh's household. And um, then the second stage was when he saw an injustice being committed against a slave uh, by an Egyptian and he killed the Egyptian and he had to run away and he became a shepherd for 40 years in the wilderness. If you're a shepherd in the wilderness for 40 years, there's a whole lot of nothing to do sometimes. So he had a lot of time on his hand. And then third stage began when he, he saw the, the burning bush and God came and spoke to him and said, you know, Moses, I want you to go, go free my people back in Egypt. You need to go back there. And then he went to, to the Pharaoh and he said, let my people go. And eventually the people were let go and, and they were freed from slavery. And then... Moses was leading the people, and they wandered around for, for 40 solid years. Um, but Moses was, was in the midst of, as he was the leader of a new nation, of people who were oftentimes whiners and complainers. Okay, that's just the way it was. Um, his father-in-law, Jethro, saw something as he was spending some time with Moses. And, and he saw that Moses had no breathing room in his schedule. And he told Moses, you know, you're taking too much responsibility to do too much, and you're doing too much for other people. And in Exodus chapter 18, verses 17 through 18, this is what Jethro said. This is not good, Moses' father-in-law exclaimed. You're going to wear yourself out and the people too. All right, now let's stop right there and establish something. Now, he says, you're going to wear yourself out and the people too. Not having breathing room in our lives and, and running around in the danger zone doesn't just hurt you. When you're the cranky prophet, everybody else is cranky around you too. When you're the cranky anything, guess what? Everybody else doesn't want to be around you. It affects them, causes them pain. He goes on, this job is too heavy a burden for you to handle all by yourself. What incredible wisdom. He says, Moses, I want you to know and understand your limits. Find your sweet spot. Okay, then, and as I said, they wander around the desert for, for 40 years, at the end of which God reminds Moses that he's not going to get to go into the promised land. Why? Because he had previously been disobedient to God in a specific command, and he was guilty of this disobedience, and it was during a period when he was doing too much, and he was the cranky prophet. Okay? It cost him. And God said, you can't go in. You can go up on Mount Nebo, and you can look at the promised land, but that's it. Then, Moses, it's time for you to die. So here is Moses' reflection on time our schedules, and death itself. It starts off, it says, Psalm 90, a prayer of Moses, a man of God. That's the intro. I love that. And it says, Lord, through all the generations, you have been our home. In other words, in our slavery, O oh God, you have been our home. In our suffering, O oh God, you have been our home. In all of life's joy and pain, O oh God, you have been our home. And what are homes? Homes are designed to be comfortable, places of invitation and kindness and grace and places where there are breathing room. So our relationship with God itself is designed to have breathing room. Verse 2, before the mountains were born, before you gave birth to the earth and the world, from the beginning to the end, you are God. That is, since, God, you are in charge of all things, the, every beginning, every ending, then certainly you were in charge of my beginning and my end. Verse 3, you turn people back to dust, saying, return to dust, you mortals. This is not Moses being Debbie Downer trying to bring us all down. It's sort of like, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear how mortal I am. Nope. The beauty and brilliance of Moses saying, we need to know our limits as human beings. We will die. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm going to die. Now say back, you are too. <laughs> if you're seated next to a child, that was really a hard thing to do. But it's a fact. The death rate is still hovering right around 100%. 
um, it, it, it's going to happen for each one of us. And Moses says, this is important for us to pay attention to. He said, I want you to reflect on the reality of your mortality. Verse four, for you, a thousand years are as a passing day, as brief as a few night hours. In other words, he's saying, you know, that, that little dash that exists between the moment that we're born and the moment that we die that's going to be put on our gravestones, that little dash in there, it's a blip on the screen of eternity. And yet we still matter to God. Verse 5, you sweep people away like dreams that disappear. They are like grass that springs up in the morning. In the morning it blooms and flourishes. But by evening it is dry and withered. Moses is inviting us to view our lives from the perspective that God has on our lives. And it's not that God doesn't care about us. Rather, it's that God cares so much about us that he wants us desperately to understand the brevity of our lives and the importance of time as a gift from him. Verse 10, 70 years are given to us. Some even live to 80 or 90 or 95, or 98, some live to be 100, right? But even the best years are filled with pain and trouble. All right, who believes that's not true? I don't care how your best years are, even your best years are filled with pain and trouble. It's a reality. Moses is not bringing us down. He's just speaking the truth about how life actually operates. It says, soon they, the years, will disappear and we fly away. But that song, I'll fly away, oh glory. We're going to sing that at the end today. Now, this is where it comes from. It's like the years fly away. But not just the years. One day, we too are going to, to fly away. And that's going to be a victory. Trouble and sorrow exist in our lives, yes. And time really does fly. And one day, we are going to fly out of time and enter fully and completely into eternity. But you know what? If you're 15 years old, you just wonder when in the world is 18 going to finally get here. You, you think that 18 is so far off. And let me assure you that when you're 52, 18 feels like yesterday and those memories are profound and, and, and just so crystal clear. And, and when I'm 82, I'm going to look back at 52 and I'm going to say, what? <laughs> I mean, life is brief and our memories are short. I mean, Dr. Seuss probably said it best. He said, how did it get so late so soon? It's night before it's afternoon. December is here before it's June. My goodness, how the time has flown. How did it get so late so soon? But isn't it true? No matter what age we are, time truly does wind up flying by, especially the more years that we have behind us. Verse 11, who can comprehend the power of your anger? Your wrath is as awesome as the fear you deserve. Now, that sounds rough and bad and difficult, but here's what it really means. If we could see God as he truly is, if we could see God in all of his holiness, in all of the, the fullness of his awesome nature, we would give God the attention, the time, and the reverence that he deserves, and we would be more careful about every moment of time that God gives. We would measure our time on the scale of God's grace and mercy. Verse 12, teach us to realize the brevity of life so that we may grow in wisdom. Now, did you catch that? It's like, in other words, we don't get this without being taught it. Moses is saying, we need to be taught the brevity of life by God. We're not going to get this on our own. The only way to receive this truth is through the wisdom of God. Left to our own selves, our own devices, 
we will continue to act as if our days are not numbered and they will go on forever. But you and I are not going to live in these bodies forever. Oh, we're going to fly away and live forever, okay? That's a promise about eternal life. But here and now, we're going to die. It's a fact. There is a limit to our lives. Now think about it. When we, in our daily lives, we talk about, about things coming to an end, about limits. We say, what's the deadline on that, right? Okay, and that focuses our attention. It makes us uh, uh, make sure we get something done in a specific amount of time. We turn the project in when the deadline hits. And sometimes we even have another phrase that we'll say, because we're not sure how serious the deadline really is. What's the drop dead day when you need this, right? Really want to know. I know there's a deadline, but what's the real, real, real deadline? And God's saying to us, there's a real, real deadline right here, right now. And those with wisdom to know that time is limited will focus on what's most important to them and most important to God in loving him fully and completely. And understanding this truth helps us reorient our schedules and our lives properly. How do we need to, are we, are we under-challenged? Are we over-challenged? Are we hitting the sweet spot of our lives? Where are we at? What do we need? Uh, Bronnie Ware is a, uh, an Australian hospice nurse, and she works with people who have less than 12 weeks to live. And she wanted to do a study about uh, what regrets people had about their lives as they came to the end of it. And so she asked a series of questions and, and the number two regret that people have is what we think is the number one regret. And that's it. she said, people say that they wish that they hadn't worked so long and so hard. She said that there wasn't, there wasn't one man who didn't say to her in those last 12 weeks, you know, I wish I hadn't worked quite so hard and quite so long. And you know what? The bad news is, women, you're catching up on that scale. So, but what's the number one reason? Number one regret that people have, she says, is uh, it says, I wish that I had had the courage to live true to myself and not the life that others expected of me. You know, God is in the do-over business. Um, God is, is forgiving by nature. Um, and, and I'm glad that, that God is so gracious to offer us some do-overs when we mess up our lives. But here's the thing. There's some do-overs that are simply impossible for God to offer us. I can't be 30 years old again. I can't go back and be 15. I can only be 52 and older as I make my future a reality with God. And so as a Christ follower... We get to work out with God and our brothers and sisters in Christ who we truly are and what we're going to do with that reality so then that our schedule and the way that we use our time will reflect who we truly are in God's grace. All right, so now I want you to return, return to your sermon notes. Um, and I have a question to ask you. Um, in terms of your living relationship with Jesus Christ, what are some things that you need to add? Um, especially, especially here if you're in the under-challenged area, what do you need to add, uh, pick up? What, uh, what do you need to subtract from your schedule to reflect more deeply your values and the values that, that God wants to be a part of your life? Um, a different one, the greater than symbol. Um, what, what do you need to do more of? You're already doing some of it, but maybe there are some things that you say, you know, I really need to be engaged more in that. And then the less than. Uh, what, what maybe you should keep doing it, but it needs to be less important in your life. You need to give yourself less over to that specific task in your life. And we all have those things. And, and if you're in your small group, I hope you'll, you'll talk about that um, in your small group, um, because some other people might have some insights to share with you that might be helpful in terms of the way that you deal with your schedule as well. But here's the thing. Time is absolutely 
a precious gift from God to you and to me. And our schedule gets to reflect that truth. So how are we going to give however many days and years we have left to the cause of Christ, to the the way that he wants us to live our one and only lives? Moses' words here help focus us, help us to, to really, truly treasure and honor the gift that time is from God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the gift of time. Help us develop breathing room in our schedule that, that helps us not operate in the danger zone, but also helps us not, not operate in the realm of being under-challenged, but, but push us to, to, to really hit the sweet spot of how we can most deeply and lovingly and fully connect with you. We love you, O oh God, and we thank you for, we thank you for Jesus who, who truly does know exactly what we're going through and who wants our schedule to reflect all the ways that you love us. We all agreed in Jesus' name and said, amen. Amen. Well, before we close this morning, I'd just like to take an opportunity, if I could, I don't think... Last week, I got to welcome in our two newest staff positions, so I want to introduce to you, if I didn't, Phil McReynolds on piano and keys and organist, and he can wave to some of you back there. <laughs> and, and then also Adam Klingman, who's going to be our full-time assistant music director. And uh, I've told every uh, service so far, and I want to be sure you know this too, let's see how many years it's going to take for his hair to look like mine. And you just be the judge what happens, okay? And we'll see. It won't take long, I'm afraid. But anyway, uh, we're going to close with a song. Uh, I think Pastor Jamie mentioned it. I'll fly away. So we're going to set things up for tonight a little bit, okay? So stand with us and let's sing I'll fly away. Communion elements are up front for those who wish to partake in Holy Communion after the worship service. And the altar, of course, is always open for prayer. And if you have something you'd like to come and and spend some time in prayer, um, please do so. And we have people up here who would love to pray with you as well. Um, I love that song because I think it's such an incredible reminder for us of the joy, the immense and incredible joy 
that awaits us in heaven. But we also have to remember that we're still here and there is work to be done and we still need to grow in our relationship with Jesus and, and have that breathing room, that time of growth, and then to invest in the kingdom. So as you go forth this week, think about this whole issue of breathing room. Where is your sweet spot? Where is it that you just know God wants you to be? Amen? Yes,